Hi, I'm Mike Aronowitz with Seattle City Light, and I'm excited to take you on a tour of the steam plant today. Now we're gonna go inside the building and show you some of the amazing technology and equipment inside. But first, I wanted to kind of provide some historic context for the building here on the outside and tell you why it's here in the first place. So in order to do that, let's go back in history. Let's go back to the second half of the 19th century and really some of the earliest days of Seattle. Now, a lot of people associate the Denny Party um, as being the first white settlers to come to the future Seattle area when they came to Alki Point in 1851. But actually, um, earlier in 1851, another party led by L.M. Collins came to what would become Seattle. And so they established a settlement here on the banks of the Duwamish River in what would become Georgetown. And by that standard, I like to consider Georgetown to be the oldest neighborhood in Seattle. Now, Collins eventually sold part of his property to Julius Horton. And Julius had a son named George. That's where Georgetown gets its name from. Now, Julius Horton was a developer. And under Julius, uh, Georgetown really began to industrialize and, and grow economically. Now, Julius sold part of his property to a couple of beer makers. And those beer makers would go on to help establish the Seattle Malting and Brewing Company, which would later be famous for making Rainier beer. By 1904, Georgetown was definitely a company town. The brewery employed over 300 people. And in that same year, 1904, Georgetown incorporated as an independent town and they elected the superintendent of the brewery to be their first mayor. Georgetown would ultimately get annexed by the ever-growing city of Seattle in 1910. And Seattle itself, of course, was undergoing tremendous growth during this time period. There had been the discovery of gold up north in the Yukon and Alaska, which brought many more people to the Seattle area. Seattle was growing as a hub for commerce and shipping throughout the entire Pacific Rim and the West Coast. And just look at the population numbers. In 1890, there were 40,000 people living in Seattle. By 1910, there were 240,000 people living here. Now, the rapid growth in Seattle was accompanied by the rapid electrification of the city. In the 1880s, there had been several small operators of steam plants in the downtown district providing electrical services, but the National Corporation of Stone and Webster consolidated all of these individual operators under one umbrella and called that new company the Seattle Electric Company. Now at that time, the electrical industry was still fairly young. Uh, the applications were primarily used for industrial purposes and manufacturing pur purposes, and it was also quite expensive. But a third very important sector of the economy that was supported by electrical power on a larger scale was what was called electrical traction, or in other words, transportation. And what that means is electric streetcars. Now, Seattle had had a pretty uh, extensive public transportation system in the 1880s, and it was all um, powered by horse-drawn trolleys. By the 1890s, the public transportation system was pretty much electrical, and the Seattle Electric Company held a monopoly on providing these electric streetcars. The streetcars were so um, significant in, in the development of Seattle because a lot of the neighborhoods that we're familiar with today throughout Seattle really were able to spring up because people now with these electric streetcars could reliably move around the growing city, whereas before it was more of a challenge. Now, in 1906, the Seattle Electric Company was really concerned about making sure that they had a reliable source of power to provide power for their streetcar system. And to sum it up, the Georgetown steam plant was built by the Seattle Electric Company in 1906 to provide reliable power for its streetcar system. When the Seattle Electric Company decided to build the Georgetown steam plant, they hired Frank Gilbreth to oversee the design and construction of it. Now, Frank Gilbreth was many things. It's hard to sum up his career, but he was an industrial engineer. He was a management consultant, a pioneer in the um, use of time and motion study and scientific management. And he and his wife, Lillian Gilbreth, really 
brought their family business and made it into one of the largest consulting firms in the country. Frank and Lillian were what we would call efficiency experts. They would look at the ways that people performed routine activities in a variety of different fields, whether construction, the medical field. There's even footage of the Gilbreths providing uh, recommendations to the old New York Giants pitching staff. So they, looked, they worked in sports as well. And they would try to come up with systematic ways for people to improve their processes. Now, they had amazing careers. They did all of this while having 12 children. The story is that they would walk down the street and people would say, how come you have so many children? And the Gilbreths would say, they come cheaper by the dozen. And so they're both well known for being depicted and their entire family being depicted in the book and movie, Cheaper by the Dozen, which came out in 1950. This is the person that the Seattle Electric Company hired to oversee construction of the steam plant. Now, Gilbreth, when he began the design of the steam plant, he was gonna design it out of steel and brick, like most of your other major industrial buildings on the West Coast at that time. And he was lining up some contracts in San Francisco where he had a lot of business. And what happened in 1906? Well, devastating earthquake and fire, which really leveled the city of San Francisco. And much of San Francisco had been constructed of steel and brick and wood. And so, well, you know, Mr. Gilbreth had second thoughts. At the same time, there was a shortage of good uh, quality structural steel. There were rumors of labor issues on the horizon with the steel workers, and none of this sounded very good to Mr. Efficiency. So he decided in midstream, instead, to design this building um, to be constructed of reinforced concrete, which, by the way, stands up to seismic activity and fire much better than steel and brick do. And so ultimately, one of the reasons that this building is significant is it's one of the first major reinforced concrete buildings on the West Coast. Now, one of the truly remarkable things by today's standards is that the Seattle Electric Company bought this piece of property in 1906. They hired Gilbreth in 1906. Gilbreth did the initial design of steel and brick in 1906 and then changed to reinforce concrete in 1906. And substantial construction was completed on the building in 1906. But that's another thing that's associated with Gilbreth. It's the concept of fast track construction where you begin construction and you don't necessarily have a complete set of plans finished. You could have people pouring the foundation while you still have engineers and architects finishing the design for the next stages of construction. Now, the general layout of the steam plant is like a capital T, where you've got the leg of the T dominated by the boiler room, and you've got the horizontal top part of the, the T um, characterized by the engine room. And there's a really kind of clear division of labor between those two sections of the building where the boiler room is dedicated to the production of steam and the engine room is dedicated to the production of electrical power. Now, if you come to the steam plant in person, you'll see and you'll learn about all different types of efficiencies throughout the building. One of the most particularly interesting ones, I think, is that the steam plant was designed to be able to burn two different types of fuel either uh, coal or oil, and it did so at different times in its history. The system for delivering coal into the building is particularly interesting. Trains would deliver coal to this yard where I'm standing, and then conveyors would bring the coal up to the second story of the building where the boilers are located, and then it would begin its process of being transformed into electrical power. We're gonna take you into the boiler room now for a closer look.